As far as some trends we're seeing with new drug approvals, uh, we're seeing more manufacturers seeking uh, new drug um, or orphan drug uh, approvals with the FDA. So that's kind of a trend we're seeing. Also, specialty pharmaceuticals um, are really increasing as far as uh, as far as manufacturers developing uh, research development and then also submitting those new drug applications to the FDA. So those are just a couple trends we're seeing. Uh, objectives by the end of uh, the presentation today, I'd like to be able to identify the new drugs that were approved within the last year, uh, describe certain important characteristics associated with them, um, and then finally, and this is kind of the most clinical um, uh, application piece of this, be able to discuss pertinent patient counseling points, monitoring parameters, things like that, that again, really are applicable to daily practice. So um, as I've done the past year, I really want to kind of leave you with an idea of where this new agent might fall into existing um, existing practice. Um, so with these agents being new, I won't claim to be an expert, which is one of the beauties of this presentation. Um, so if any of you do have uh, you know, any additional knowledge or have experience with, with any of the new agents, please feel free to share and please feel, uh, feel free to share that with the group. Um, I know in the past we've had um, the folks with uh, a array of different experiences. We even had some representatives from certain manufacturers for some of the new agents. So please speak up if, if you do have any additional um, additional experience or anything to say there. Also, if there's questions throughout, uh, this is fairly informal. Just shout them out or raise your hand. I'm happy to entertain those. Um, and between Stephen and myself, we'll do our best to answer those. So uh, you'll probably have to shout pretty loud. This is a rather large room. So, um, but again, anytime you have a question. All right, so first couple slides here. This is just kind of an overall list of the new molecular enemies, um, again, that I'll be talking about that were approved in 2012. Uh, and these are in order of, uh, basically in order of approval, so that's the, that's the random reason there. Uh, so these are the six agents that I'm gonna be spending a little bit more time on. So we're gonna spend you know, several slides each and talk, some, talk about some of the ins and outs and kind of go through them in a systematic approach. Uh, this list is uh, kind of the additional list. So these are some other, other notable new molecular entities that I'll spend just a slide each talking about because one, there's not enough time, and, and two, I thought that maybe the other agents are a little bit more uh, yeah, important for our practices. So I'm not going to go through them now, just kind of there for your, uh, for your reference and to keep everything in one place there for you. We're going to jump right in um, with the first agent today, and that's Lorcaserin, and this is the brand name Felvik, um, and this uh, was approved in June. It's an Arena Pharmaceuticals product. And with Lorcaser, this, this uh, new molecular entity actually has a bit of a backstory. Uh, back in 2009, a new drug application was submitted for this chemical uh, by the manufacturer, and that new drug application uh, was subsequently denied in 2010. Um, and the reasons because, or reasons for that are, um, a couple of safety and efficacy concerns cited by the FDA. So what the manufacturer did is they went back and gathered some more data or presented more studies to the FDA and that led to its eventual approval this past year in June. So just to kind of set that um, out at the start here. As far as drug class, you'll see the asterisk around the drug class here. Um, for any new agent I talk about that is either first in class or is a new, completely new class of medications um, approved for a given indication, uh, I've kind of indicated that by the asterisk. Uh, so this is a new class, our first in class, is a serotonin 2C receptor agonist. Uh, so without talking about exactly what that means um, as it translates into what it does in the body, we'll just talk real briefly about the mechanism of action, so kind of the end result there. Essentially what it does is it works on neurons in the hypothalamus, and it works at the satiety center in the brain. Um, so these two, under mechanism of action, should really be reversed. So it increases satiety, or that feeling of fullness, and therefore decreases food consumption. Um, so it is a weight loss um, agent. Um, it is supplied in 10 milligram film coated tablets. Um, and once again, it is a weight loss agent um, indicated uh, for um, adults only. Um, now, with a, we talked about the back store, the 2009-2010 denial of that original new drug application. With the application submitted to the FDA in 2012, the manufacturer kind of agreed to set forth certain stipulations with regards to its prescribing. Uh, so everything under this, under FDA indication on this slide, fits under that section of the package insert. So these are the stipulations uh, related to um, who it can be prescribed to essentially. 
So is adjunctive, so patient must be on a reduced calorie diet and have a regimen of increased physical activity, must have an initial BMI of at least 30, um, or 27 uh, to 29.9 essentially, with a weight-related comorbidity. So that can be one of several things, something like hypertension, type 2 diabetes, um, and there's a couple others as well. Also, included in the limitations, um, uh, labeled limitations include co-administration with any other weight loss agent, uh, so that is not recommended. And then they also have as a limitation that the effect on the cardiovascular morbidity and mortality has not been established. So we have kind of those hard weight loss um, endpoints from clinical trials. We don't exactly know what or if that translates into any clinical benefit with regards to cardiovascular um, concerns. Uh, as far as the dosage, it is twice daily. Um, again, remember, it's just a single dose that, or a single strength that is approved. So it's 10 milligrams twice daily. And also, this is also kind of part of those, uh, those stipulations that the manufacturer agreed to. Uh, patients taking this agent must be evaluated after 12 weeks of therapy. If they haven't lost at least 5% of their body weight, um, then the agent should be discontinued. We'll talk a little bit more about that and what we've seen in clinical trials. As far as the precautions for lorcaserin, um, serotonin syndrome, this is a serotonin agonist. So this mainly uh, applies to patients who may be on other serotonergic agents. So if you jump down there to the last bullet on the slide, drug interactions, there's your um, other serotonergic agents. Uh, so that's the issue there. Um, Velvular heart disease, there are certain serotonin receptors on the cardiac tissue, and it was, it was a pretty low rate, but there were some, um, again, velvular heart issues. Um, so counseling patients, I'm watching for things like edema, um, CHF types of symptoms, um, dyspnea, those things are, are going to be important to this agent. Cognitive impairment. Uh, this was another issue seen, again, quite rarely, but it was seen in clinical trials. Uh, there were some attention issues, some memory issues with this agent. Uh, psychiatric disorders. They talk a little bit about uh, mostly a higher doses that were used in, in certain clinical trials about euphoric type effects. Um, so that was, that was an issue also. <coughs> Use of anti-diabetic agents. Uh, they did some targeted clinical trials in patients only with diabetes. Um, and this is a weight loss agent. Remember, it works on that satiety center. So patients are eating less. So you can imagine where if a patient is also on a hypoglycemic agent, um, that could kind of potentiate that issue if they're not eating quite as much. This one is pregnancy category X. Um, to dive into that a little bit further, uh, clinical trials did not show any teratogenic potential in animal models. Uh, the issue here is that weight loss simply isn't recommended for pregnant women. So that is the reason that it's granted that category X absolutely should not be used in pregnancy. Again, drug interactions, we talked about that. Monitoring. Uh, we talked a little bit about the psychiatric disorder issue. Um, so, you know, counseling, periodically counseling patients on, uh, you know, if they're experiencing depressive symptoms, suicidal thoughts, those types of things, you know, make sure that they're aware of that and, and that they're reporting those things. This one um, also did, and this was, it was a pretty minimal amount, but you did see, or in clinical trials, they saw a slight decrease in red, red blood cell counts uh, for some subjects. Um, so it's kind of optional if you want to monitor an occasional uh, CBC on these patients as well. Adverse effects to the agent. Uh, these are those that were seen in at least 5% of clinical trial subjects, and they, they divided these out uh, between the studies that were done in the diabetes patients and those that were done in non-diabetic patients. Um, so for non-diabetic patients, um, headache, dizziness, fatigue, nausea, dry mouth, and constipation were the most commonly seen. For diabetic patients, once again, hypoglycemia crops up here. Um, headache and fatigue, that was consistent with the non-diabetic group. Um, and then back pain and cough were, were also cited for, uh, for that particular patient population. So just a couple key points from clinical trials. When I present this data, we're kind of just getting a look at um, just kind of the basics as far as the efficacy, um, and safety parameters um, that ultimately led to the new drug being approved. So of course we all want to know how much weight does a patient lose on this agent. Um, well at one year of therapy, and they looked at lorcasterin in comparison to placebo, uh, patients on lorcasterin lost about seven more pounds than the patients on placebo did. So that's one year of treatment, seven more pounds in the placebo group. So what do you think about that? Not huge, right? Kind of a modest effect there, I would say. Um, all right. Secondary improvements um, uh, were seen.
seen in blood pressure and cholesterol um, in the non-diabetic studies. Um, and then also in A1C and fasting blood glucose for those patients who have diabetes. So those are some kind of secondary uh, um, benefits to the agent. So patient educational points related to this agent, um, of course, kind of those more common side effects they might experience, the headache, the dizziness, the fatigue, um, the importance of um, uh, those uh, you know, additional features which they should uh, um, be employing in their lifestyle, reduced calorie diet, the and, that was a typo in the handout that you guys have, I think that actually says or, um, so, or some, yeah, or. Uh, so that should be a reduced calorie diet and increased physical activity. The monitoring requirement for the weight loss at um, 12 weeks, and whether this is something you know you share with the physician or the patient, um, it really should be something that the physicians are, are monitoring as well. Um, possibly you'd want to talk about the signs and symptoms of the valvular heart disease. So again, dyspnea, CHF types of symptoms, edema, things of that nature. Changes in motor behavior, so that's I think an important thing to mention to someone newly starting on this agent. Um, if the patient does have diabetes, counseling on. Um, uh, the possible increased risk of, of hypoglycemia. Um, and then, of course, you want to really monitor to see if there are any other serotonergic agents. Current status with this agent, um, it is not yet available. Um, remember, it was uh, approved back in June. Um, it is still awaiting final DEA scheduling. So we talked before about um, the slight risk of euphoria at the higher doses. So this is kind of the issue that's leading uh, the to the DEA taking action as far as scheduling of this agent. As of January, the DEA did recommend that this agent be a, um, a Schedule IV um, controlled substance, and we expect that to be the case. But the final ruling is not yet official, I guess. So as soon as it is, and really it could be any time, um, this one should be available um, commercially within a couple of weeks, I would guess. So that's kind of the current status on this agent. So keep some of these kind of bottom line things in mind. And we're going to jump to our new drug rating scale. So for those of you who have been to um, the new drug update that Steve and I have presented in the past, uh, we kind of use this very, very basic scheme of rating these new drugs. Um, so when using this system, think about things like, uh, you know, a need. Is there a need for this new agent? Is this solving a need to? Um, how does it compare with the existing drugs for that particular indication? Um, you know, think about overall efficacy, safety, those types of things. All right, so with this scale, and you guys are going to uh, uh, use the scale along with me, and we're all going to determine where we think this falls on the scale. There will be some disagreement. That's okay. Um, so if you give it a 1, uh, you feel that there's some sort of significant advantage over existing therapies for that particular indication. For a 2, um, no significant advantage or disadvantage, or maybe the advantages um, you know, kind of equal out the disadvantages. Uh, so that would be a 2. And if you're going to give it a three, you feel that this agent has some significant disadvantage to, to other agents for a particular indication. You can use half numbers. I'm trying to think of all the things that I've been burned on in the past. You can use half numbers because I know, you know, I tell you one, two, or three, and then I give you a half number that I give it. So um, half numbers are okay. So keeping this in mind, one, two, or three, and kind of the bottom line things we talked about with Lord Kayserin, how many of you would give it a one? Couple, one and a half. Couple there. About a two. Two. A lot of hands for two. Two and a half. About a three. Trees. What did I give it? Uh, I was I was going through this yesterday. I was looking at the ratings I'd given it. I don't know a week ago, and I was disagreeing with myself. So um, I gave it um, originally a two and a half. I guess I could argue for a two. Um, I just felt that, and this is again an editorial on my part, um, it's modestly effective and you know as far as some of these um, side effects, so these adverse effects that we're seeing in clinical trials, the psychiatric issues, the cognitive issue, potential issues, again they were rare but you know I kind of like to see how those bear out in, in practice. So I give it a 2.5 if you guys can agree or just disagree with that. So keep that scale in mind though we're going to use that after each of the, um, the six main drugs we talked about. Questions or comments about Lorcasterin? One question I always get asked, I'll just make this disclaimer now, is about cost. Um, I have it for some, not for all, and I don't have a cost for more case rent, so I apologize there. I gather the ones that I did. All right, jumping in, if there's no comments, questions, uh, we'll jump into the next agent. Uh, and this one is uh, Mira Begron, or Vetric. Now, I kind of struggle with the pronunciation on this one. 
And just kind of as a hint for, for those of you who have access to the pharmacist letter, um, they have really good pronunciation keys. Um, and they even have audio clips of someone saying the generic name and the brand name for a lot of, or a lot of drugs in general. So that's what I used for the pronunciation on some of these, including this one. So this is Miramedron or Mermetric. Um, this was also approved in, in June. Um, it's an Estellus pharmaceutical patient. So you see the asterisk here again with regards to the drug class. This is a new, another first-in-class agent. Um, this is a beta-3 adrenergic receptor agonist, so beta agonist here. Um, so what beta-3 receptors do, you might be asking yourself, is they play a role in relaxing smooth muscle. Um, so this is an agent um, for overactive bladder, so you can kind of see where that might make sense. Uh, so let's see here. So mechanism of action, again, it does activate the beta-3 receptors as an agonist um, on the bladder, and that relaxes the detrusor muscle, uh, which results in an increased storage capacity. So that's kind of um, the end result there as far as the mechanism goes. Um, supplied in two strengths, 25 milligrams and 50 milligram extended release tablets. And again, it is FDA indicated for the treatment of overactive bladder in patients who have urgent continence, urgency, and frequency. It is dosed at 25 milligrams once daily to start. Um, and this is kind of an interesting nuance um, regarding the dosing. If after eight weeks the patient doesn't get sufficient uh, relief or it's not, uh, not classified as, as being effective, then at that point you can increase to 50 milligrams. So we'll talk a little bit more about what they saw that led to that in clinical trials. If patients have severe renal impairment or moderate hepatic impairment, you don't want to go above that 25 milligram. Some precautions indicated include increases in blood pressure um, and urinary retention, and there are no labeled contraindications to this agent. So that is a benefit. Uh, this one is pregnancy category C. Drug interactions uh, cited, it is a moderate inhibitor, inhibitor of the cytochrome P450 2D6 isoenzyme. So if you have other agents that are substrates of that system, um, basically you want to monitor the effects uh, of whatever agent that would be. Um, also, uh, there's an interaction with digoxin, and they recommend using the lowest dose possible for the shortest period of time. Um, well, not lowest dose and monitor the concentrations of digoxin is what they recommend. Adverse effects uh, to near bed run, um, and these were uh, seen in at least 2% of clinical trial subjects. Um, hypertension, and to kind of give you an idea of um, uh, the magnitude of that that was seen, and it's not, you know, over hypertension necessarily, it's increases in blood pressure that, that we're seeing. And this is sort of an interesting uh, phenomenon. Um, increases of blood pressure were seen in about three and a half millimeters of mercury systolic and about one and a half diastolic. So not huge, few points. Uh, but that, those increases, those numbers were seen in patients who were healthy. These were patients, this is before the phase three clinical trials, in patients that actually had overactive bladder. So these were patients that did not. Um, so they saw that increase in blood pressure there. Interestingly, in patients who actually have overactive bladder that were treated with this agent, um, the increases in blood pressure weren't that high. Um, they were about a half to one point systolic. So kind of an interesting anomaly there. Nasal pharyngitis um, is also cited, uh, urinary tract contraction, and headache. Um, kind of round out the rest of those adverse effects. As far as clinical trials go, um, they looked at the number of incontinence episodes and the total number of intuitions per 24 hours. Uh, so it lowered the number of incontinence episodes in the 24 hour period uh, by 0.3 to 0.2. So less than one, uh, one half of an episode per day. Number of intuitions um, lowered it uh, by right around a half of a, of a intuition in a 24 hour period. Uh, or, or, I'm sorry, about a half uh, fewer than placebo, um, just to clarify there. So you know, you look at the number, and I don't, I don't know what you guys think about it, but it kind of looks, you know, modestly effective, not, not too great. It is fairly comparable with uh, the other class that we have, the traditional class that we have to treat overactive bladder, which is what? Dintropan? What class is Dintropan? Another some students who can probably answer. Antimuscarinic? Yes, yes. So that's our other traditional class. There's several agents within that class um, used to treat overactive bladder. So again, efficacy is, is, is fairly comparable. 
Um, time to effectiveness. So this is kind of where we saw that the dosing with the, the eight weeks increased to 50. Um, they saw that the 25 milligram strength was effective within eight weeks of therapy. Um, interestingly enough, if the patient was on 50 milligrams, effectiveness was reached, if it was going to be reached, um, within four weeks. A couple of patient education points um, with this agent. Uh, they do need to swallow a whole. There is an extended release mechanism which, uh, which does um, or require that. Uh, uh, blood pressure and heart rate. So if a patient has some cardiovascular uh, disease states or risk factors, it might be worth, uh, it might be worth a conversation. Um, and the urinary tract infection. So maybe counseling on signs and symptoms um, of that. So overall, with this agent, um, they kind of recommend it as an alternative to the anti-muscarinics. Um, again, they are all kind of only modestly effective um, overall. Of course, one patient might respond better to, to one agent than another. Uh, so overall, you know, generally recommend a generic anti-muscarinic first and save some money, most definitely. But if a patient can't tolerate it or if it's not effective, you can certainly use this, this agent. And again, this is a new class um, for overactive bladder. At this point, we don't have any efficacy about combining with an anti-muscarinic, so that's not recommended at this point. Um, and then as far as the cost goes, I do have that on this one. Um, it is a little bit more than some of our brand name um, anti-muscarinics. Um, so a couple examples of, of those agents would be like Enablex, um, Tobias, so there's a couple others out there too. Um, those run around, right around $150 a month or so. Um, this one, from what I was able to see, uh, was about $210 per month. So, you know, that might um, kind of play into some, some third-party formulary decisions. Uh, but again, this is, this is a new class. All right, so with that in mind, we're going to rate it. Who's going to give this one a 1? Significant advantage. Okay, a couple hands there. Uh, we'll, we'll pass over the hats for now, so you got to pick a higher number for now. All right, 2. Who's going to give it a 2? All right, a lot of hands there. Three. I'm going to give it a three. A couple threes. All right, so mostly twos. Um, I gave it a one and a half to a two. So I can use that number. That's not fair, is it? I give it a one and a half to a two. So I also give it a range. Um, so I like that it is a new class. Um, it kind of offers a second alternative to patients who can't tolerate some of the anticholinergic side effects that our anti-muscarinics have. Um, so I like that factor. Um, of course, the cost is a little bit inhibitory there, possibly. Uh, for some, um, so that's any comments, questions about your background? Yes. Uh, where else do you find these the three the beta three receptors? That is an excellent question. So the question was, where else do you find the, the beta three receptors? So again, of course, they are in the bladder. There are two other places that that they cited that they're located. I can't remember where they were. I looked it up too. Anybody know? Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm sorry, I don't know the answer. I did earlier this week, but um, again, they are a couple. It's pretty limited as far as where those are located in the body, but there's there's a couple others. Any other questions that I can't answer? All right. All right. Next agent is um, a new COPD agent. Uh, this is aflavinium or Tudoris at Press Air. Has anybody had some experience or has dispensed this one? Okay, a couple of hands up. That's always kind of interesting to find out. Uh, this one was approved in July. It's a Forest Labs product. And as you can see, there's there's kind of two components to uh, the brand name, two trademarked components. So the Tudoris is the chemical itself. The Press Air is um, the actual inhaler device. So this is a new device um, for for this inhaled medication. So we'll talk about how that works. So aflodinium, as you may have guessed, may not have guessed, by its name, is an anticholinergic. Um, of course, not the first in class. We've got a couple others also available um, for the treatment of, um, of COPD. Um, it is an anti-muscarinic, anticholinergic, of course. So it inhibits the muscarinic three receptors on the smooth muscle, causing bronchodilation. So just like our other anticholinergics, uh, this one, it has just one strength. Um, it is 400 microgram um, per actuation, and this one is a dry powder inhaler. So again, we'll talk about and, and show you um, kind of how this new device, this press air device works. So it is approved for the maintenance treatment of bronchospasm associated with COPD. Um, this is a once daily medication, so it is long acting. What other once, or, I'm sorry, I said once daily and that was a lie. It is not once daily, this one is twice daily. 
Um, but the question was, what other long-acting anticholinergic do we have available for COPD? Spirevir or teotropium, right? Okay, so we've got to be thinking about spirevir in the back of your mind as we go through this. All right, because how many times a day is spirevir given? Just once. Okay, so this one is again 400 uh, micrograms, so one puff twice daily. Precautions with this agent. Okay. Precautions with this agent um, should not be used uh, for uh, acute exacerbations. Again, this is maintenance therapy. And the first four sub bullets you'll see under precautions here, these are really class related. Um, so you'd see this also with, um, with a spider bug. Um, so acute exacerbations, um, in certain cases, it can cause a paradoxical bronchospasm, so that um, might be worth uh, counseling patients on. Should be avoided in near go glaucoma. Urinary retention, again, it can have those systemic um, anticholinergic side effects. The last one is unique to this product, though. Spirea doesn't have this. Uh, severe hypersensitivity to milk proteins. So this being a dry powder, um, lactose is one of the inactive ingredients that um, comprises that dry powder. So if a patient does have a severe hypersensitivity, hypersensitivity to milk proteins, um, this should be avoided. Um, no labeled contraindications with this one either. Um, it is pregnancy category C. And you can see there on the slide the image of the actual press air device. So it's pretty easy, three-step process. Patient presses that green button, removes the cap, presses that green button at the back there that you'll see, releases the green button. The little colored control window in the middle there, that one that's red, that will turn green when it's ready to inhale. Patient inhales it, um, and then that turns back to red. Um, and puts the gap on. So pretty easy to use. Drug interactions, the only thing noted is other anticholinergics. Um, adverse effects that were seen in clinical trials, um, headache, nasopharyngitis, and cough were the, were the most common three. Key points for clinical trials as far as efficacy goes. Um, so what they looked at is the change in baseline pre-dose FEV1, or the forced expiratory by volume in one second, which is the standard for, for these types of COV dependent medications. So they looked at the change in baseline pre-dose at 12 weeks compared with placebo. And I'm realizing I don't have actual numbers there. Um, and what they, what they did show is that in two thirds of the clinical trials that brought this to market, um, subjects did use last daily um, rescue albuterol. Um, so you know you might ask, how does it compare with teotropium versus spirema? Um, there is one, I believe, head-to-head -head trial that was done. It wasn't part of um, the trials that were submitted with the new drug application. It was external to that. Um, but it looked fairly comparable as far as efficacy to Spirella. So patient education, again, very important for any maintenance medication, whether we're talking asthma or COPD, um, should not be used for rescue therapy. Um, this is a long-acting formulation. Talk about some of those class side effects related to it being an anticholinergic. Um, and then, of course, use of the press air device. That's probably going to be one of the most important counseling points um, in ensuring patients know how to use it. So I know we talked a little bit um, already about how they use it. <clears throat> it should be stored in a sealed pouch, in the sealed pouch it comes in until they're ready to use it. With any dry powder, uh, patients really need to be taking a quick, deep breath um, to, to get that powder moving in and moved into the bronchioles. Um, now that differs, right, from our meter dose inhalers. That's more of a slow, deep, steady breath, right? So that is a significant difference with any dry powder inhaler. Um, dose counter um, it goes down in intervals of 10. So, you know, definitely worth letting patients know that, that they're not going to see go from 60 to 59. Again, it's going to go down by 10. Um, once it gets to 10, um, it does, once you're nearing zero, it does start to, the dose window there, the little indicator window, does start to become red, so you kind of know I've only got a couple doses left. Should be discarded 45 days after um, first use, or of course when the dose counter gets to zero. So again, it's uh, 60 actuations per inhaler, and it's twice daily, so it should be a 30-day supply for just about everybody. Um, and then comparators to consider, um, really the only true comparators, teotropium or spirema. Ipertropium is uh, short-acting yet. So that's really not the best um, comparator here. Um, and you know, kind of when we're putting this, you know, giving this new drug a rating, um, we got to think about those those issues with spirevir too, as far as the dosing, 
Um, I did indicate or did uh, include a picture of the experiment on the bottom right there. I know you can't see it real well there, um, but just to remind you, if you're not real familiar with Spireva, um, it comes with a little hand healer device. I think that's the, I think that's the trademarked uh, device. Um, and there's little capsules that the patient has to punch out, put into the device, they have to punch a hole through it with the button, and then inhale it from there. So as far as the dosing goes, uh, spirenica for most patients is going to be maybe a little bit more cumbersome. But remember, spirenica is once daily, Tadorza is twice daily. So you kind of got to weigh those things. Cost, I do have cost numbers on this one as well. Um, it actually looks like it's a little bit cheaper than spirenica. Um, this one, from what I was able to find, is about $220 a month. That compares to about $240 for Spireva. So that may be a benefit to this one. All right, with that in mind, who's going to give this one a rating of a one? Okay, handful of hands. What about a two? Okay, a lot of hands there. Three. Everybody for a three. I see no hands for a three. Um, I gave it a two. Uh, I think there's some certain benefits for certain patients, but uh, you can really have to weigh it based on patient preference, adherence, you know, are they going to struggle with the twice daily dosing? Do they have some dexterity issues that, you know, maybe warrant this over the spirema? So there's a lot of factors to weigh in there. So um, I think it's a, a good product, and again, it's probably going to be very beneficial for some patients. So I gave it to Questions, comments about aclodinia? Okay. Third agent we're going to talk about is linaclotide or linzess. This is a new agent for constipation. It was approved in August by Ford, also Forest Labs product. And this is another first in class agent, as you can see there. It's a monolate cyclase C agonist. How many of you can see that drug class and know exactly what that means as far as the mechanism? Anybody? I can. Dr. Lee probably did. Um, so as far as what that means clinically and what it actually does in the body, um, this is kind of the progression here, but essentially it uh, has kind of an osmotic effect. Um, the overall result is it increases uh, GI uh, stimulation of um, chloride secretion into the GI tract. That pulls osmotic, it pulls water along with it to increase fluid that's moving along in, in overall transit time. It's, it does have a local effect, so there's very minimal absorption. Um, so that's a benefit. Um, so again, it's kind of that chloride um, activation there. Does anybody know of another um, uh, agent for constipation that kind of has a similar mechanism with activating those chloride channels? Amatiza, very good. I'm impressed. So lubiprostone or amatiza, um, I, not, I haven't seen this one a whole lot. I haven't dispensed much of this. But this one is an agent that kind of has that similar mechanism. It's a different class, but it also causes that chloride secretion pulling the water along with it. So I think it's always nice when you can kind of link it to something we may already know. Um, all right. Um, another kind of secondary mechanism, this was more seen in animal models to date. Um, they showed that it might actually decrease the activity of certain pain-sensing nerves in the intestine intestinal tract, so that could be a benefit as well. Supplied in two strengths, 145 and 290 microgram capsules, and it has two approved FDA indications. It's approved for irritable bowel syndrome, syndrome that is constipation predominant, and also chronic idiopathic constipation. So that's constipation that has no <coughs> other identifiable cause. Uh, so the dose, remember, there's two strengths that are available, and those are linked to the particular indication so for patients with IBS, um, is the higher 290, 290 micrograms once daily. For chronic idiopathic constipation, that's the lower dose, 145 once daily. Uh, this one does have some specifics uh, with regards to when to dose. Uh, should be given on an empty stomach at least 30 minutes prior to the first meal of the day. So that's a very important patient counseling point here. If it is given with food, particularly fatty foods, um, it really causes a, a pretty great increase in loose stools and diarrhea like a result. So that's an important point there. Precautions, the only one uh, labeled is diarrhea, um, so that makes sense. Contraindications, the first one is sort of interesting. Um, so the pediatrics up to six years of age absolutely should not be used in, and they really say all pediatrics, so that includes six to 17 years of age, really should not use this agent either. Um, what they found in in mice, when it was looked at in mice, juvenile mice that were given 
that one or two doses of this agent, um, some of them, I don't have the exact numbers, died within a 24 hour period. So I wasn't able to find a whole lot of information about you know, what happened, um, but that was concerning enough for them to kind of take the, um, the mouse age, extrapolate that out into human years, so that was um, uh, children up to about age six, um, so absolutely should not be used again. That is animal models that, that did see that effect. And then known or suspected GI obstruction this agent should be avoided in as well. It is pregnancy category C. Um, drug interactions. Remember we talked in the mechanism about this local effect. It works really only on the intestinal epithelium. Um, because it's not absorbed systemically, um, there aren't any labeled drug interactions. So that's a benefit. Adverse effects, um, diarrhea was uh, by far the most common. Um, that occurred in about, let's see, about 16 to 20% or so of clinical trial subjects taking, uh, taking the medication. Uh, the other adverse effects that are most common are also GI in nature. So abdominal pain, distension, flatulence. As far as the efficacy for clinical trials that was seen with monoclotide, uh, this gets a little hairy with regards to exactly what they studied. So let's see if I can kind of condense this. So for IBS, of course, they had studies in IBS population and then in chronic idiopathic constipation. So we'll start with IBS. Um, so they had a combined response um, designation, essentially. Uh, so in order for a patient to be, uh, for it to be determined efficacious or for the patient to be determined a responder, they had to have meet this combined response criteria in at least 9 of 12 weeks that they took the medication. So the criteria under that combined response includes at least a 30% reduction in abdominal pain and then a complete spontaneous bowel movement of at least 3, or three per week and an increase of 1 per week for, from baseline. Um, so I know again, kind of numbers get a little hairy here, but that's, you know, they met those two criteria in at least nine of those 12 weeks, they were considered responders. So, hard numbers, about 12.4% of those taking the linocotide um, met those criteria, or met that criteria of having that combined response. Uh, that compares with about 4% of placebo. What do you think about that efficacy? Is it great? And this is subjective. 12.4%, um, that's to me isn't, isn't that great of a number. Um, the numbers needed to treat to have uh, one clinical response or one combined response um, was 12. Um, so 12 patients need to be treated with this agent for at least 12 weeks for one of those patients to fall into that category. For chronic idiopathic constipation, they looked at um, the second bullet, they looked at or under the combined response for IBS. So they looked at just the complete spontaneous bowel movement um, criteria. <laughs> And, and again, in at least nine of 12 weeks. Um, and it was about 15 to 20% or so for those treated with clinical loci, uh, compared with, and this is a range based on the multiple clinical trials that were conducted, 3.3 to 15.5% for placebo. So again, not a huge difference um, in my mind. Um, so overall, uh, for patients um, with these indications, may want to consider um, something like an antispasmodic that can really help with associated. Um, some of the, the SSRIs, even the TCAs, um, can really assist with that, with that pain as well. Um, so, you know, many of those agents, including dicyclamine, a pretty common antispasmodic, you know, being generic, those might be a, uh, worth trying initially. Uh, so this one can be, you know, potentially tried after that, um, after a couple other agents have been used. Um, all right, so with that all in mind, who is going to give this one a rating of a 1? Two, okay, three. All right, maybe a few more on the two side. Um, quite a few on the three though, so kind of between a two and a three. Um, I gave it, well, I don't know, now I'm waffling. Um, I gave it a three, I could be, I could be argued, I could be convinced to give it a, a two and a half. So uh, again, with the minimal, fairly minimal efficacy that I, that I saw in clinical trials, um, you know, I didn't see a, a huge benefit to this agent. Um, especially with some other cheaper options um, being uh, potentially pretty efficacious as far as the pain is concerned. So questions or comments about linoclotide or Linzess? <laughs> All right, moving right along. Uh, next agent, and this is the, the second to the last agent that I'm going to talk a little more in depth about. See how I'm doing on time here. Uh, this one is teraflunamide or Obagio. How many of you have seen or heard of this medicine?
medications. All right, you hands in the audience. This was approved in September by Genzyme. And this one I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on. This one is um, it's, it's a very interesting drug. It's um, pretty significant as far as um, its indication goes. It is a, a multiple sclerosis agent. Um, but it's really mainly going to be dispensed uh, in the specialty pharmacy arena. So there's a select number of, of specialty pharmacies that have uh, status to actually dispense and, and manage patients on this agent. All right, so this is a permitting synthesis inhibitor. And if you look at the name, it sounds very similar to another uh, medication that we have. Anybody know what it is? I hear some whispers that sound right. Leflunamide, very good. Yes, that is a medication used for uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, so de delaying the progression there. So teraflunamide is actually the active metabolite of leflunamide. Uh, so they are very similar. They're essentially the same. Essentially, you know, on the, the end result, same thing. So pyrimidine synthesis inhibitor, without going getting too, uh, too much into the mechanism of action specifics, it is an immunomodulatory agent that has anti-inflammatory pro uh, properties and may also possibly decrease the number of activated lymphocytes in the CNS of those patients with multiple sclerosis. Um, two strengths, um, seven and 14 milligram oral tablets, and I underline oral for a reason. Uh, when we look at the, the FDA approved agents for multiple sclerosis, um, there aren't many that are oral. This is just the second uh, that, is, that is an oral agent. Uh, the first was approved just a couple of years ago. So we'll talk about some of those other agents uh, all right, FDA indication, once again, relapsing forms of multiple sclerosis, which are the most common forms. Um, it is dosed at 7 or 14 milligrams once daily. Um, kind of a whole host of precautions here. Uh, decreased white blood cells. Um, I do have the numbers on that somewhere. I think I'll get to that. So it did see a decrease in white blood cell count, so counts in patients uh, monitoring for signs and symptoms of an infection. Uh, peripheral neuropathy, um, acute renal failure, hyperkalemia, those are pretty rare, but they are still, still um, uh, published as precautions. Um, severe skin reactions, including Stevens-Johnson syndrome, syndrome were reported. And um, some blood pressure in, um, increases as well. And as far as the, the uh, level of, of increase there, about 2.7 to 2.9 um, milliliters of mercury systolic. So not huge few points, um, but again, it is labeled as a precaution. Contraindications, um, kind of the biggie here, severe hepatic impairment. Um, this one, as you'll see in the black box warning, um, does have a potential to, to have some hepatic toxicity associated with that. So that kind of translates into some of the monitoring parameters that I'll mention in a moment. Um, pregnancy, this is also pregnancy category X. Um, and this one does have teratogenic potential. Um, so that certainly has been shown here. Um, you get some skeletal um, deformities, um, fetal duct, there's some other um, real issues there. So this does have the teratogenic potential. Um, and then current leflunamide treatment, um, obviously you would want to use them both together with this being the active metabolite of that same agent. So black box warnings, um, once again, the hepatotoxicity concern and, um, and teratogenicity associated with it. So there is a pregnancy registry um, for this agent. Uh, monitoring parameters are fairly extensive, which is one of the reasons that it is going to be managed in the specialty pharmacy arena. Uh, Transaminases, so liver, um, liver enzymes, uh, bilirubin, and a CBC within six months prior to starting the agent, um, and then they have to. This is fairly extensive. They have to get their ALT uh, monitored monthly for the first six months of treatment, and then periodically thereafter um, monitor for bl monitor blood pressure, make sure there's no issues there, and then of course the signs and symptoms of infection. Again, it is pregnancy category X, as we mentioned. Um, the agent is, teraflunamide is a, an inhibitor of cytochrome P450 2C8, um, so we want to be cautious about um, using it concomitantly with medications that are substrates for that system. It is also a, it's a weak inducer of the 1A2 isoenzyme, so um, again, something to just kind of watch for if you have other agents that are substrates. It can decrease the INR for patients on warfarin by about 25%, um, so an interaction there to be watchful for. And then finally, it can increase a patient's exposure to ethanol estradiol and levonorgestrel, 
which are most common estrogen and progesterone components in our oral contraceptives. Uh, so again, something to be aware of. Uh, adverse effects, these are those that were seen in at least 10% of uh, clinical trial subjects. Uh, the ALT elevation, again, we talked pretty extensively about the hepatotoxic um, uh, potential with this agent. Alopecia, um, some GI issues, and diarrhea and nausea. Um, influenza and paresthesia. So those are those tingling um, or kind of prickly feelings um, that most often occur in the extremities. So I mentioned before that we talk a little bit about some of the other agents that are FDA approved for relapsing forms of multiple sclerosis. So here they are. Got our abagia there at the bottom. So this just kind of looks at the route and frequency. I know it doesn't kind of give, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of criteria to compare these on, but uh, what I wanted to kind of point out is Again, this is just the second oral approved medication for MS. Um, so the other, as you'll see there, um, is femoral water gelenium. Uh, this was approved in 2010. Um, so again, that's just this, this is just the second um, agent. Um, as far as efficacy goes with all of these agents, fairly comparable. There's really not one that stands out or is that or is that or is much less effective than the others. Um, so fairly comparable. Um, so again, kind of talking back, uh, you're backing up and talk a little bit more about Jelania. There's some issues for patients that hurt, have certain heart problems that shouldn't um, be taking Jelania. So, you know, maybe for those patients that really we want to shoot for an oral agent, um, this would be a good, good option for them. Um, as far as cost goes, um, important issue here, these drugs are expensive. Every one of them on this list here is, is rather expensive. Um, the cost of Abagio uh, per year, any guesses? Higher than that? 5000 much higher than that. This is about $45,000 a year. That's pretty, that's pretty pricey, right? Actually, if you look at this one compared with the others listed here, it's actually about the cheapest. So um, it is cheaper than most of the others um, that I was able to see. Jelenia even costs, um, costs more than this agent. So and about $45,000. Um, as far as efficacy goes, um, again, we already talked that really with any of these agents, there's really not one standout or one or two standouts. Um, annual relapse rate, um, they looked at that kind of as their um, primary endpoint. Um, so for those taking the, the active medication, um, about a third, um, or about 0.37 or 37 um, uh, percent there for the, for the relapse rate. And that compared with about um, half of uh, patients. Um, that's not that's, that's about 5.54 uh, for those taking uh, placebo. So those numbers um, equate to about a 31% relative risk reduction um, in that annual relapse rate. Um, it also showed uh, significantly reduced uh, lesion volumes that were seen on, um, on, on patients' MRIs. Safety, once again, um, kind of the babies, hepatotoxicity potential, um, the mean decrease in, in white blood cell count, it's about 15% on the average. So again, really monitoring and counseling patients on those signs and symptoms of infection. Patient education, um, medic I think this is just kind of for our information, medication uh, guide is required with every dispense um, for this agent. Um, most definitely the pregnancy risk. The pregnancy risk applies to both females and males taking this agent. Um, so that's important there. Um, risk of infection, we talk about that. Uh, peripheral neuropathy, blood pressure effects, again, fairly minimal, but it still might be worth uh, talking about. The monitoring requirements, remember, they're pretty extensive, especially early on. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to mention here is with regards to elimination of this drug. Um, this drug is cleared extremely slowly from the body um, after the last dose is taken, and actually can stay in the body for up to two years. So, if you have a patient um, who is, you know, maybe wanting to attempt pregnancy or you have another reason that we really need to get this out of the body quicker than that um, two-year period, there is an accelerated elimination procedure um, that can be used. Uh, basically, what that is is an 11-day course of either full styramine or activated charcoal, and um, at that point, your, your levels are pretty, pretty minimal on this agent. So, that's just kind of out there in case it's needed. All right, that's it for Terry Flumer. All right, so who's going to give this a rating of a one? Handful. Two. One hand there. What about a three? Well, we have a decent number in every group. Um, uh, what did I give it? I'll give it anything. <laughs> oh, I didn't rate this. Let's see, what would I give this? Um, I think I'm going to give it, I don't know. Uh, one of the other 
other issues that I mentioned with, or I did mention with this, is that it is, once again, the active metabolite of leflunamide. Leflunamide is available very cheaply. Um, so some prescribers may choose to use that agent um, off-label for MS. Um, so with that in mind, sorry, I didn't give you that piece of information before. I don't know, I'm gonna give it to you. Two and a half. I'll defer to Dr. Lee. <laughs> I defer to him on most everything. Are any questions or comments about uh, lipoglutamine or teriflutamine? I'm in the study state. I'm sorry? I'm in the study state. It may take two years to eliminate, so is there a state? Yeah, time to study state. Shoot, I'd love to have <laughs> yeah. that. Do you know? Because you're going to talk about time. Yeah, it is a while. Yeah, it is a one. It is a one. We'll go with that. Um, we don't know exactly. Yeah, there's no loading dose. Um, but it does take a while for study state to be achieved. I'm sorry. Other questions? Again, I prefer ones that I can answer. Yes. Um, are there other meds that are that there's a caution to use because of pregnancy in males? Um, good question. So the question was, are there other agents that are you know potentially tragic and have precautions for, for males using them? Um, yes. <laughs> Far than specifics, uh, but when you think about like something like um, you know acutane, which is very much concerning for female patients, um, that's not a concern for male patients with regards to the pregnancy risk. So, anybody give us an example of a drug that would be a concern uh, with regards to pregnancy for a male taking it? Lutamide. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Any others? Gosh, I can't think of any others offhand. Yeah, relevant. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. All right. Any others? Thank you guys, this is very helpful. All right, so there's a couple others. Other questions? All right, the last one that we're gonna spend a little bit of time on is a Pixaban or Eloquist. This is a new antithrombotic. Um, this is approved, um, they kind of threw this in there pretty much the last couple of days of the year. This is approved at the end of December um, and it is a bristol myers squid um, agent. And this is an oral factor 10A inhibitor. Um, is this first in class? No, what other agent do we have that is oral factor A inhibitor, factor 10A inhibitor? Yes, Riberox standards or Alta, very good. And that was approved uh, just in 2011. So this is kind of a uh, newly emerging um, a group of oral antithrombotics. So second in class for the oral. Uh, so mechanism of action, pretty easy to remember here based on the drug class, is selectively blocks the active site of clotting factor 10A. So I'm going to show you on the next slide kind of where that falls in the clotting cascade. Two strings, 2.5 and 5 milligram tablets, and it has an indication for atrial fibrillation. So to reduce the risk of stroke and systemic embolism in patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation. Does Riperoxaban or Zerilco have that same indication? Yes, it does. It has that, and it has a couple others as well. But this is the only indication for Pixman at this point. All right, so here's our clotting cascade, and I just showed this. I'll show it real briefly, just to kind of show you where some of our oral antithrombotics fall on this, on this whole system. So kind of at the bottom there. Let's see if I get my pointer to move in there. All right, so there's our fiber clot. So that's kind of the end point of the clotting cascade, right? Um, so where does Warford work on the system? Uh, clotting factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. Those four right there. All right, where does Dabigatran or Pradaxa work? This one was approved a few years ago. It is a direct thrombin inhibitor. Works right there. It's kind of that last step in the clotting cascade. So then a Pixaban and Ribroxaban work at kind of a step preceding that um, at uh, the factor 10A. Without belaboring that, we will move on. Um, it is dosed at five milligrams twice daily. Um, if a person has two or more of the following criteria, um, listed on the second bullet point there, you really want to limit them to two and a half milligrams twice daily. But for most patients, it would be that five milligrams um, twice daily. Uh, precautions include serious bleeding and prosthetic heart valves in those patients that should be um, should be avoided. 
Contraindications to expand include active bleeding, makes sense, and severe hypersensitivity, also makes sense. Um, this one is uh, pregnancy category B. Interestingly, ribaroxan is category C, um, so I'm not sure exactly what led to um, the, the difference there. Uh, the drug interactions. Uh, this one is a substrate of both cytochrome P453A4 and also the P glycoprotein transport system. So if you uh, have a strong dual inhibitor or dual inducer of either of those, um, you uh, need to be watchful of, of concentrations. Um, and then, so that's kind of on a pharmacokinetic standpoint. Pharmacodynamically, of course, if a patient's taking another anticoagulant, antiplatelet, anything that's going to cause a potential for bleeding, of course, we need to be cautious there as well. Adverse effects include bleeding. It's pretty basic. Uh, blood box warning. Uh, discontinuation in those at risk for a thrombotic event. So one of the most important, if not the most important cause of bleeding, <laughs> patients should absolutely not abruptly stop this agent um, if another anti-thrombotic agent is not on board. Um, they really have a, a pretty significant risk for a thrombotic event. As far as clinical trials go, there were two uh, main, pretty large, very large clinical trials. Um, the Aristotle, Aristotle trial, which looked at Epixaban versus Warfarin um, in AFib, and then the Abro study, which looked at the agent um, and compared it with aspirin. Um, and the aspirin dose was 81 milligrams, 324 milligrams once daily, so mostly low, lower dose aspirin. Um, so uh, first we'll start with safety, um, looking at uh, major and non-major bleeding compared with Warfarin trial. As you can see there by the hazards ratio, this one caused significantly less bleeding than warfarin did. Um, and again, you can see the numbers there for yourself. Um, in the Ambrose trial, so looking at it versus um, aspirin, there was no significant difference in major bleed um, compared with aspirin. So efficacy, next point here. Um, Aristotle, once again, looking at it with warfarin, uh, as you can see by the hazard ratio once again, it was significantly better at systemic, uh, or I'm sorry, stroke or systemic embolism prevention compared to warfarin. And also significantly reduced all cause death um, as compared with warfarin. So, pretty good numbers as far as safety and efficacy go here uh, compared to warfarin. The APRO study um, also saw a significant improvement um, compared with aspirin for stroke or systemic embolism. Um, this study was actually ended early. They met some pre-specified efficacy endpoints, which caused them to terminate the, uh, the trial um, earlier than intended. So though it says no significant difference in all-cause death compared to aspirin here, that's not because there, there necessarily wasn't. Um, it may be an issue that it was um, that the study was ended early. So bridging with the an other anticoagulants. So in practice, how do we do this? We've got patient on warfarin, um, and we want to convert them over to a expand. What do we do? Stop warfarin, and as soon as your IR drops below two, you start ribaroxaban. I'm sorry. Oh my goodness, I didn't change it. Copy the slide from last year. All right, start a pixaban with IMRs less than two. Thank you. Because that's actually not right for ribaroxaban. I believe ribaroxaban is actually less than three. Um, so fix that all on your handout. So that should be start pixaban, the drug we're talking about, when the IR is less than two. Uh, but going back, going back the other way, so for whatever reason, patient needs to be converted back to warfarin. Uh, this is a little bit more challenging and also a little bit more risky. Patients tend to experience um, a greater risk of, of thrombotic events if you go the other way. Um, discontinued Pixaban, um, it's recommended that you start a parenteral anticoagulant along with warfarin until your INR is acceptable. Um, then you can drop the parenteral. All right, so here is just a very basic um, comparison of some of the oral antithrombotics for atrial fibrillation specifically. And um, as far as the features on the lab, that's not all the features we could compare them on. There are a lot. Um, but we'll just talk about a few things here. So I'm looking at Pixman versus Ribaroxaban, so same class, right? So relative. Um, and then also to Bigatran or Pradaxa. Um, and then Warfarin is kind of our last comparator there. So as far as indications go, once again, a Pixman is only approved for atrial fibrillation at this time. Ribaroxaban has an additional couple of indications. Um, and only one other is listed here. There are a couple others as well. Um, DVT prophylaxis. Um, so you can use it as an alternative to Lobinox uh, for patients undergoing hip or knee replacement. Uh, one of the other indications for ribaroxaban is patients that have recurrent DVTs or pulmonary embolisms um, can be treated with that as well. 
Um, Dimbic at this time only has the atrial fibrillation uh, um, indication, and then warfarin, of course, has numerous indications. So we're just talking about an AFib here for the most part. As far as dosing goes, um, a pinch span is twice daily, once again. Um, Ribaroxaban is once daily. Um, however, it must be dosed with the evening meal, so there's some specifics as far as when to give it. Um, Dimigatrium, like a pink span, is twice daily. Warfarin, for most patients, is once. Efficacy versus warfarin, so kind of one of the one of the big things we really want to uh, consider here. Pixaban in clinical trials did show superiority to warfarin um, as it relates to the AFib endpoints. Ribaroxaban in the phase three trials that led to its approval um, did not establish superiority to warfarin, um, but that non-inferiority endpoint was met. Um, Dimigatrium also did show superiority uh, to warfarin. Again, that's solely looking at the AFib endpoint. As far as the antidote, so patient takes too much, what do we do? Um, of course, with warfarin, we've got vitamin K to kind of reverse the effects there. Um, but as far as the other three orals go, um, there really is nothing um, specifically that would be classified as an antidote in those situations. Monitoring uh, parameters. Um, no standard monitoring parameters for any of the three uh, newer agents. Um, of course, that compares with uh, regular IR monitoring for warfarin. Um, interactions, um, apixaban and ribaroxaban um, share um, the interactions with the 3A4 system and the people like the protein. Um, Dimigatran or Pradaxa um, has uh, issues with drugs that increase gastric pH um, and also that people like a pro protein transporter. Um, warfarin, of course, a number of pharmacodynamic uh, interactions. Um, but then also a lot of food issues with um, with regards to vitamin K um, content there. So again, this is not an inclusive comparison or an all-inclusive comparison. These are just a few uh, a few parameters. Patient education for a band. Once again, patients should not abruptly discontinue this agent. That is very concerning from a um, from a safety standpoint. Um, the anticoagulant effect persists for about 24 hours after the last dose. So maybe that's something to mention. Maybe not. A med gag is required with this agent, talking about the bleeding risk, those types of things. Of course, you do want to talk also about the bleeding risk with patients directly. They should tell all physicians and dentists and the other providers of, of care um, that they are on the agent. And then you also want to look at any concomitant medications and herbal medications to make sure we don't have any pharmacodynamic or kinetic drug interactions on board that we need to be concerned with. Um, cost of this agent, I wasn't able to find um, hard numbers here. Uh, but I think it should be pretty comparable to Zervelto and Prodex and the other two newer antithrombotic agents. And those are running right around uh, $250, $260 a month or so. All right, with all that information in mind, efficacy, safety, all that good stuff, who's going to rate this one as a one? I see some, a couple of tentative hands. Um, two. Okay, three. I gave it a one and a half. Um, I like the efficacy. Um, of course, it's got the twice daily dosing, so maybe that's going to be a concern for some. Um, but really, we've got superiority to warfarin in clinical trials that we've seen. Um, comparable cost from what it looks like. Um, I gave it a one and a half. Questions, comments about a PIS band? Yes? Um, so, um, talking about the Aristotle trial, Aristotle trial looking at it um, compared with warfarin, so the question was with regards to how well the warfarin uh, patients were controlled and whether their INR was therapeutic. Um, I have it right here. I actually meant to mention it. Um, INR was therapeutic in 62% uh, in of the time for patients taking warfarin. So, that is fairly, um, uh, fairly close to what we see in, in clinical practice. Um, so, that's, that's a really good question. Anything else? Okay. Okay, wow, that does it for kind of the six biggies. Um, now we're going to spend just a little bit of time. Uh, I got about one slide each on some of the other new molecular entities that were approved. We're going to start with the Ingenome, uh, which is Picado. Um, this one is a new gel, uh, a new molecular entity uh, in gel formulation for actinic keratosis. So, what is actinic keratosis? Um, I have an image of it on the bottom right there. Uh, they're kind of small, rough, raised areas uh, that are caused by what? Cause. Sun exposure? Yes, cumulative sun exposure. 
Um, so this is damage caused by that sun exposure over time. And these lesions actually can, in some cases, lead to certain types of skin cancer. Um, so the mechanism isn't real well understood, but they think it induces a cell death and um, kind of relieves uh, or improves some of those lesions there. Uh, dosing, it is available at two strengths. And as far as which strength to use, um, it depends on where you're applying it on the body. So if you're um, applying it to the face or scalp, if your lesions are there, it's the lower strength, 0.015%. Um, once daily for three days. If you're using it on the trunk or extremities, it's the higher strength, 0.05% daily for two days. And I've underlined the two and the three days because that is significant. If you look at other medications used to treat actinic keratosis, they are weeks to months in duration. So this is a very short um, duration of time for, for treatment. Uh, precautions, if it's administered um, close to the eyes, um, you can get some significant eye issues. Um, local skin reactions, really any of the agents um, used to treat actinic keratosis and to give you an indication of some of those agents. Um, 5 fluorouracil a um, which is Aldera, um, diclofenac topically, um, those are other approved agents. Um, all of them can cause some inflammation and some irritation, some local irritation. Patient counseling points, uh, spread the gel on the area, let it dry for about 15 minutes. Um, after a period of six hours, um, they may wash it off with, with uh, a mild soap if they desire. Um, this one should be kept refrigerated uh, before suspense and also after suspense. So that's an important patient counseling point. Um, they, should, they should know about it. Um, cost of this one um, is, is kind of up there. It's similar in cost to amiquimod, um, about $600 or so for a course of treatment. Um, one tube, they say, covers about um, the size of a post-it note. Um, I know that seems very, very small, but you know these lesions typically aren't, you know, really widespread. They're pretty, pretty um, localized. Um, so again, similar in cost to a, a um more expensive than the five or so, more expensive than the Dacofenac or the Solarase. So um, kind of up there in the price area, but really you got to think about that two or three day treatment, um, treatment duration, um, pretty minimal. Questions at all about that one? Short and sweet. Okay. Next one is Taflucrost, or Zyoptin. Uh, this is a prostaglandin analog, uh, kind of joins a, a few others we have available uh, for the reduction of intraocular pressure most often used to treat glaucoma. Uh, it is one drop in the evening, which is kind of consistent with the other agents we have available, and I've listed those comparators, uh, other um, ophthalmic prostaglandins um, on the bottom there. Precautions, these are class precautions. You can get some pigmentation changes um, of the iris, and also eyelash changes, which are um, uh, increased length, thickness, those types of uh, things with eyelashes. Um, so again, comparators, they're all once daily um, dosing, so similar there. Um, what's different about this agent? Uh, this one is preservative-free. So um, this might be a really good thing. You know, if you've got the preservative issue, and if that's the problem that might be causing some irritation with some of the other agents, um, and you know, maybe that's affecting adherence, compliance. You know, this might be a good option for some patients. Um, so, you know, how is it preservative free? It is available in single use kind of droppers. Um, so, you get a box of, um, a pretty big box of, of 30 of those single use droppers there. So, that is kind of the significant difference with this agent. Questions, comments? Okay. Uh, next one is a Vanafil or Stendra. Uh, this is the latest phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitor approved for erectile dysfunction. Available in three strengths, um, as you'll see there. Um, the standard dosing is 100 milligrams um, 30 minutes prior to sexual activity um, for most patients. Uh, drug reactions, um, concomitant, uh, strong 3A4 inhibitor should be avoided. Uh, the precautions are pretty, pretty similar to uh, the other PE5 inhibitors we have. Uh, hypotens uh, hypotension risk, particularly if patients are on hypotensive medications, uh, priapism, loss of vision are, are labeled. Uh, potential benefit of this agent, this is a, a real spell out or a real clear yet, might be faster acting than the others. Uh, what they saw is that 80% of men who took the agent reported a response within 15 minutes of taking the medication. How long does it take with the others? about 30 to 60 minutes, give or take, depending on the agent. 
Um, so this may be touted as the first kind of on-demand um, uh, drug treatment for erectile dysfunction. So. All right, next one is prep open. I believe that's the, this one's kind of bringing some of the money. I, think, I believe it's prep open. Um, so this one is a new follow prep agent. Um, and it's uh, got three active ingredients, um, sodium picosulfate, which is the molecular entity in it, um, um, magnesium oxide and citric acid. So it seems kind of complex, it's really not though. Sodium picosulfate is a stimulant laxative, um, magnesium oxide and citric acid, um, when they're in solution, so when this thing is reconstituted, it comes as a powder, when it's reconstituted, that just makes um, magnesium citrate, mag citrate. So we all know that one, right? So that is a cosmotic um, laxative. So again, it's indicated for colonoscopy, bowel prep. Um, you can kind of see how it's supplied there in the image. But there's two powder packets and then a, cup, a, a cup that they use for reconstitution. And it's just five ounces of water that they reconstitute each packet with. So this is the lowest volume bowel prep agent available. Um, they have to stir it for two to three minutes. So that's a good power set point there because that's a pretty lengthy period of time. Um, dosing, there's a couple different regimens they can use. Um, split dose the day before. Um, the specifics there for yourself. So after the first dose is taken, they need, do need to follow it by at least five eight out eight ounce drinks, um, and then the second dose, whenever that's taken, needs to be followed by three eight ounce drinks. But again, it is the, the lowest volume available. It's still a half a gallon. It's still, yeah, it's it's still a, a decent amount when you when you consider the five follow up drinks and three follow up drinks. Good point. Uh, precautions uh, because you do have your saline uh, laxatives in there. Uh, renal issues. You want to make sure your patient is adequately hydrated before they start the regimen, uh, or that can be a concern. Fluid and electrolyte balances. Um, possibility, probably not real, um, real prevalent. It's a one-time kind of kind of deal. So, um, but those are listed. Benefits: once again, lowest volume, um, and it generally is better tolerated than, than your powder, your polyethylene glycol based solutions. Um, this one, let's see. Cost is a little bit more pricier than your pack solutions. It's about seventy-five dollars or so, compared with about twenty to sixty dollars, depending on what kind of base solution you're using. Um, this one, because of its low volume, has become um, the top-selling bowel prep agent in Canada. So we'll kind of see what it, how that plays out here. All right. In the interest of time, I'm going to move on. If you guys do have questions? Jump down and, and ask at the end here. Um, got just a few more to get through. Um, next one is Icosapent or Vasipa. And this is an ethyl ester of EPA. What's EPA? Icosapentanoic acid, right? One of the two omega-3 fatty acids we find in fish oil. So there's EPA, and if you look at kind of the middle of um, the spelled out version of EPA, you can see the icosapent right in it. So uh, kind of easy way to, to pick it out there. Uh, so this is just EPA. So what other, all right, so let's talk about the indication first. So this is an adjunctive diet to reduce to diet to reduce triglycerides in people with severe hypertriglyceridemia. Do you know of any other uh, product that's FDA approved by prescription that can be used for this? Lovaza, yes. Lovaza contains both EPA, both esters of EPA and DHA. So let's talk about how they differ. Dosing is the same. Two caps twice daily with food, that's the same as Lovaza. Efficacy, that's where we get a little bit difference here. Um, uh, triglycerides you get about 27% lowering with this agent um, that compared with an increase about 10% with placebo. Uh, Lovaza, is that better or worse as far as efficacy? Right now? Uh, Lovaza is better. Um, Lovaza you get about 45% lowering or so um, of, the, of the triglycerides. However, um, as far as LDL goes, Lovaza can also increase your LDL by about 45%. It can be significant in some patients. This one does not have that increase in LDL. So that may be a, uh, a true benefit of this one. Um, so what they've shown is that EPA alone does not have those increases in LDL like the EPA and DHA combinations do. So sort of an interesting feature of this one. Um, cost between the two agents is fairly comparable. So that's the SEBA. Uh, next one is Parum Panel or Phycompa. Uh, just real quickly with this one here. This is a new um, anti-epileptic agent. Um, it is in a new drug class, that's why I chose to include it here. It's a selective, non-competitive AMPA receptor antagonist. I'm not going to talk about the specifics. Feel free to, to look those up on your own. Uh, but it's an adjunct for partial onset seizures in um, those ages 12 and greater. 
you can see the dosing they, uh, there, uh, basically a titrate up to a factor that's up to 12 milligrams um, daily. Um, again, it is a, uh, a new drug class with a novel mechanism. Uh, there is a pretty significant black box warning that you need to be aware of though with this one with regards to psychiatric um, uh, reactions that were seen in clinical trials. So things like aggression, hostility, homicidal ideation were, were seen in clinical trials. And that is certainly a, 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 an important um, point to consider here. Last couple, um, Profelmer or Folazac um, is next. And this one is the first agent um, for the, I, this particular indication. Um, and it's for diarrhea in patients that have HIV or AIDS who are on current um, antiretroviral therapy. Um, so as we know, diarrhea is very common in those patients on, on uh, antiretroviral uh, regimens. This one, um, we can kind of link to another drug we already talked about. Um, uh, blocks chloride secretion in the intestinal uh, epithelial cells. So remember we talked before about linocotide and an increasing uh, chloride secretion and um, the water that goes along with it. This blocks it, so it's kind of a reverse mechanism there. So this blocks the, sec the secretion and then also the water that might follow along with it. 125 milligrams twice daily, um, effect persistent throughout clinical trials. Uh, very important, whenever we're stopping or slowing down diarrhea, we need to make sure that it's not caused by another GI disease or has an infectious cause, that's very important. Interestingly, this is just the second botanical product approved by the FDA. Um, so you can see the plant, I'm, I'm going to slaughter its name if I try to pronounce the, the Latin name. So that's the plant, it's grown in South America um, in the wild. So it's harvested um, uh, or uh, uh, derived from that plant. And again, it is the first approved agent for that particular indication. And lomenopi, this is the last one here, and then just real quickly we'll touch on a couple of new formulations and combinations. Lomidopide or juxtapid um, is also a new class. Uh, this one is a triglyceride transfer protein inhibitor. Uh, this one is for homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. Um, so it's got pretty limited indication. It really can only be used for patients with that indication. It does have a REMS program to limit the prescribing. Um, and that's due to some, um, uh, some risk it has with regards to hepatotoxicity. Um, so it's given five milligrams once daily, um, two or more hours before the evening meal. So some specifics there. Um, adverse effects, pretty significant with regards to gastrointestinal. Um, again, it does have a REMS program to kind of limit the prescribing uh, for both prescribers and pharmacies. Um, they did indicate that the cardiovascular effects have not been determined on this one. It does have some significant monitoring requirements as well. All right, bear with me, just a couple more slides here. This one is added, you guys don't have this one. Um, and this is just a couple things that were approved in uh, this year, already this year. Uh, has anybody seen Zacuity or heard of this one? Yeah, this is really interesting. This is sumatriptan. It's an ionophoretic transdermal system. So um, go back to drug delivery or wherever you learned about this and, and try to drum up the ionophoretic system. But basically, um, what happens is a patient with the onset of a migraine slaps this thing on their arm, they press a button, it's battery operated, and there's basically positively charged drug particles that are pulled through the skin through this ionophoretic electrical um, current. So kind of interesting uh, thing going on there. Um, Alan Lipton, this is uh, another DPP-4 inhibitor for type 2 diabetes, um, approved on January 25. And actually on that date, there were three drugs uh, with that chemical approved. So the single ingredient, uh, but also allopleptin in combination with pyglitazone and with metformin. So we've got three new drugs out of one. Uh, Mifomersin, um, just another one to kind of keep an eye on. I'm going to more on this next year probably if, we're, um, if we do come back for this presentation. This is an, uh, another one for uh, homozygous, homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. It's an equal lipoprotein B inhibitor. Um, it is a sub-Q injection, so that's kind of, we'll leave it at that for now. Couple minutes, almost done. A couple new formulations, I'm not going to touch on all of these, but just uh, just a couple that are, are notable. Um, the second one there, cyclosinide, is, a, is a, a steroid medication now available as a dry powder on a nasal spray um, for allergic rhinitis. Um, so dry powder, that means less dripping. Um, and it's just one spray per nostril. So that's, that's um, maybe a benefit to some patients who are used to the two sprays of the fluticasone or flonase. Um, that one is pictured on the top right there. 
Um, Xenotide by Durian, of course, that's our once weekly formulation for type 2 diabetes for, um, for Xenotide. Um, so there's some uh, certain benefits to that one. I'm not going to go specifically into them. The last one on the list there, Alendronate, uh, is now available in an effervescent tablet that is strawberry flavored. So that's uh, last couple, another um, new uh, nasal um, uh, steroid uh, medication, rotigotine or Nupro. This is actually not, um, this is newly formulated, but it was actually approved back in 2008. Uh, there are some issues with, it's transdermal, so there's a patch. There are some issues with the uh, uh, delivery system. So they took them all off the market, and now it's back and improved. Um, the one thing with that, though, is that patients can't use the same site more than once every 14 days. Uh, so they really need to be conscious of where they're putting these. Prednisone is, is now available in extended release formulation for certain inflammatory conditions. Um, that's an interesting one. Another interesting one is methylphenidate um, ER, available as a liquid um, for ADHD. And a couple new flu vaccines, real quickly. Um, a couple new quadrivalent flu vaccines. So all the flu vaccines we've had in the past have been trivalent. Now we've got a couple that have two A strains and two B strains um, of the virus. Uh, so this is this is a benefit whenever you can add more coverage without increasing side effects, which these haven't. Um, that's a, that's a really good thing. So you can expect these for this upcoming season. Um, also, we've got a new vaccine, a couple new vaccines that are used, utilizing new technology. And this isn't new technology for vaccines in general, but it is new for the flu vaccines. So flu vaccines in the past have always been grown in, in, in fertilized hen's eggs. Uh, these new ones are using a cell culture technology, not in eggs. Um, so flu cell vaccines but flu block are grown in certain cell lines. Um, and again, they're not grown in eggs. So patients with the egg allergy might be able to get these ones. Um, also, faster production time, weeks as compared with months. So this is an exciting thing as it comes, as it relates to uh, flu vaccines. Last slide, I promise, couple of new combinations. Uh, Linaglyptin and metformin available as Genta Duetto. So you've got a DPP-4 plus metformin. Um, Exelestine, so a steroid in um, combination with uh, fluticasone, um, available as dimista, and fentramine and topiramate extended release, um, now available. Um, I'm sorry, I said exelestine was a steroid. It's an antihistamine. Fentramine and topiramate available as Cucinia for weight loss, and you can get pretty significant weight loss on that one at about 20 pounds per year.